1881, somewhere in England, probably, John Stuart Mill wrote an essay called Of Names. Mill is using the word name to pick out not just proper names like Abraham or Sally, but anything that can function as the subject of a sentence. Consider the sentence LeBron dunks. This sentence has two parts. It has the subject, that's LeBron, and it has dunks, which is the predicate. LeBron happens to be a proper name, but you could write a sentence like this with a different expression in the subject place. For example, the NBA's all-time scoring leader dunks. The NBA's all-time scoring leader. That's a kind of expression called a definite description because it starts with the word the, which is called the definite article. This sentence also has a subject and a predicate. And the subject of this sentence, although not a proper name, is still the kind of thing that Mill would call a name. The first important point that Mill makes is that although the job of a name in some sense is to make an idea pop up in our minds, the meaning of a name is not an idea. When I say the sun is the cause of the day, I do not mean that my idea of the sun causes or excites in me the idea of day, or in other words, that thinking of the sun makes me think of day. I mean that a certain physical fact, which is called the sun's presence, causes another physical fact, which is called day. So the point that he's making here is that there's three things that are involved. There's the word or the names, the sun, that's a bit of language. This is made out of ink on a piece of glass. Then there's the sun, which is a giant ball of fire in space, 93 million miles away. And then there's this other thing, our idea of the sun. This isn't made of ink like the word is, and it's not made of fire and gas or whatever like the actual sun is. This is some other thing, who knows what it's made of. It's real, but it's our idea. And Mill's point is simply this. The meaning of the word sun is the sun. The sentence, the sun is the cause of the day, is not about our idea. It's not saying that our idea causes something. No, no, no. It's saying that the sun causes something. It lights up the earth and causes the day. Part of what's so influential and powerful about this essay from Mill is that in it, he makes three distinctions, and he's sort of dividing up all the different types of names. Two of those distinctions became very influential, and I'm gonna go over them now. The first distinction is between general and singular names. This has nothing to do with singular versus plural. Don't think that. A general name is a name which is capable of being truly affirmed, in the same sense, of each of an indefinite number of things. An individual or singular name is a name which is only capable of being truly affirmed, in the same sense, of one thing. For example, cat or a cat is a general name because that can be used to pick out all sorts of different things. Garfield the cat and also other famous cats. I can't think of a name of another famous cat. But Garfield is a singular name because as long as it's used with one meaning, it picks out just one cat, which is this orange cat that eats lasagna. You may be familiar with this cat. Now you'll have noticed in that passage that I just read, Mill keeps saying, in the same sense. What he means by in the same sense is with the same meaning. Garfield can be the name of this one cat, or it could be the name of a person. And those two names, they sound the same, they're spelled the same or whatever, but they actually have different meanings. In one case, it refers to a person who happens to be named Garfield. And in other cases, it refers to the cat who was also named Garfield. Mill also says why we have general names, like why they're good to have in your language, why we developed them, why we invented them if we invented them at all. It is by their means that we are enabled to assert general propositions, to affirm or deny any predicate of an indefinite number of things at once. To understand this, think of the sentence, every cat is a self-centered narcissist. That's a general claim, it's about all cats. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Mill's point is that only with general names are we even able to say this. Otherwise, in order to make this claim about all cats, we would have to construct a really long sentence that just said Garfield is a self-centered narcissist and Hobbes is a self-centered narcissist 
and, and we'd have to go through and name every single cat in order to make the same point. And we can't do that because we don't have the time to do that. And also, we haven't even bothered naming every cat. But now is when things get interesting because Mill introduces this idea of a collective name. A collective name is a name that picks out a collective, but talks about them all as one. The example that Mill uses is the 76th Regiment of the British Army. That whole phrase is one name and it picks out one thing, but it's a collective thing because it's one thing made up out of a lot of soldiers. And it's a singular name because this name can only be used for that very one thing, whereas regiment which is also collective. A regiment is a big collection of stuff. Regiment can be used for all the different regiments, the 76th regiment and the 77th regiment and regiments in other armies or whatever. And the intuitive idea is that Cat and Garfield were both non-collective names. Like they're not names for collections of things thought of as one, except they are. That's exactly what they are. A cat is a collection of molecules, cells, and the cells are made of molecules, and you put them all together, and you think of them as one whole unit, one whole thing, and that's what a cat is. And that's what Garfield is. I mean, Garfield is a fictional cat from cartoons or whatever, but if he was a real cat, then he would be made of bones and muscles and flesh, just collected together and thought of as a single thing. And that's exactly what the 76th Regiment of the British Army is. Once you think about it, there's no such thing as a non-collective thing. Everything is a collective thing, and then there are just general names and singular names. So it actually turns out that the notion of a collective name, a name for a, a, you know, a group that's thought of as a singular unit or whatever, this is not a helpful notion because it applies to everything or virtually everything, but we can see why Mill wanted to introduce it anyway. He wanted to introduce it because he wanted to make the point that even a name like the 76th Regiment of the British Army, which in some sense is not of a single thing, it's of like a, you know, a groupy thing, he wanted to make the point that this is still a singular name because you can only use it for that one thing, whereas regiment is a name that can be applied to all sorts of different stuff. So that's why he introduced the notion of a collective name, but we can make that point without, you know, introducing all this confusion. I think Mill is just genuinely confused uh, when he introduces the notion of a collective name, but that's okay. He was right about a lot of other things, so he's still, he's still good. Next, we get Mill's distinction between connotative and non-connotative names. This distinction is gonna be hugely important throughout the history of philosophy of language. Mill is sort of sniffing out one of the central issues that's gonna animate our understanding of language for the next 150 years at least. A non-connotative term is one which signifies a subject only. A connotative term is one which denotes a subject and implies an attribute. Consider this name, the Chancellor of the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. At the time of the recording of this video, I am employed as an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and there's a chancellor. He's the boss of the university. This name picks out that guy, whoever that guy is. But not only does this name specify or designate or signify this person, it also tells us something about this person. It tells us that this person has a characteristic, and that characteristic is being the chancellor of this university. And that is a job with responsibilities, like he's gotta go to all these meetings, like way more meetings than I have to go to. But he also gets paid like five times as much as I do. And then there's this other name, Frank Gilliam Jr. It signifies the same dude, but this name it just picks him out. It doesn't tell us anything about him. It doesn't tell us what his job is. It just picks him out. Hopefully you can see the difference between these two. This communicates some additional information about the person, and this just picks out the person. Mill then goes on to give an argument. This is really the only argument that appears in this paper, an argument for a controversial claim. The claim is that proper names, names like Frank Gilliam Jr. or North Carolina, those are proper names, names that would be capitalized with capital letters in English. Proper names, all of them, or almost all of them, 
are non-connotative. Proper names are not connotative. They denote the individuals who are called by them, but they do not indicate or imply any attributes as belonging to those individuals. When we name a child by the name Paul or a dog by the name Caesar, these names are simply marks used to enable those individuals to be made subjects of discourse. Okay, so he hasn't given the argument yet. So far, all he's done is make the claim that proper names are non-connotative. They just pick out objects. They don't give us any information about those objects. It may be said, indeed, that we must have had some reason for giving them those names rather than any others. And this is true, but the name, once given, is independent of the reason. Okay, so immediately Mill concedes that sometimes you give a person a name for a reason. Uh, here's a nickname. You might name someone Big Mike, right? And Big Mike might get that name because he's big. But once he has that name, even if he stops being big, even if he goes on a diet and loses weight, or by some terrible accident, I don't know, gets shorter as well, he could still be Big Mike. You might change his name or you might just keep calling him Big Mike because that's his name. A man may have been named John because that was the name of his father. A town may have been named Dartmouth because it is situated at the mouth of the dart. The mouth of a river is where the river empties out into the ocean or another body of water? You might name a town Dartmouth because it's located right near the mouth of the river and the name of the river is Dart. Cool name for a river. But it is no part of the signification of the word John that the father of the person so-called bore the name, nor even of the word Dartmouth to be situated at the mouth of the Dart. If sand should choke up the mouth of the river or an earthquake change its course and remove it to a distance from the town, the name of the town would not not necessarily be changed. So if there's an earthquake that redirects the river so that now the mouth of the river is no longer near the town, the town can still just be called Dartmouth. But if Frank Gilliam Jr. retires, because at the time of this video, you know, he's older and, and he's saved enough money, he makes plenty of money, and he might just be tired of all those damn meetings. If he retires, this name will no longer pick him out. But this name will. You can change a proper name, like you can legally change your name. But a name, a non-connotative proper name like this doesn't automatically stop signifying a person just because that person loses an attribute. Whereas a definite description like this, a connotative name, as soon as that person loses that attribute, automatically they are no longer denoted or referred to or signified by that name. That fact, therefore, can form no part of the signification of the word. For otherwise, when the fact confessedly ceased to be true, no one would any longer think of applying the name. Proper names are attached to the objects themselves and are not dependent on the continuance of any attribute of the object. In this case, the name only picks out that dude because he has some attribute. He has a job. He's the chancellor of the university. But in this case, the name picks out that dude irrespective of whether he you know, loses his job or changes anything about himself. Now you might say, in the case of a name like this, with a junior at the end, it, it does communicate some information, right? It communicates that his father was named Frank Gilliam. Okay, yeah, sort of, but Mill is gonna be able to run that same Dartmouth argument. If Frank Gilliam Jr. discovered that Frank Gilliam Sr. wasn't really his father, then he could choose to change his name, it wouldn't automatically happen right away that this would no longer be his name, this, this name would no longer pick him out. But that's exactly the sort of automatic thing that happens with this definite description. There's one more important passage that I need to read. When we impose a proper name, we perform an operation in some degree analogous to what the robber intended in chalking the house. So I think that robbers will like scope out the scene or whatever and like decide which houses are good for robbing. And then they'll put a piece of chalk on like the curb in front of the house so that they remember which house is robbable, I, I guess. We put a mark, not indeed upon the object itself, but so to speak, upon the idea of the object. A proper name is but an unmeaning mark, which we connect in our minds with the idea of the object. Unmeaning mark. That's how Mill thinks of proper names, like Frank Gilliam Jr. or Garfield or North Carolina or whatever. They're just labels. They don't refer to things by way of some description or some idea or some bit of information. 
this is a portrait of Frank Gilliam Jr. And there's two things involved with a proper name like this. There's the name, that's some ink, and then there's Frank, the guy. But in the case of this definite description, this connotative name, there's more than those things. There's the guy who, that's denoted or referred to by the, by the name, by the label. But then there's this other thing, which is the information conveyed or the information that's part of or constitutes the meaning of the name. And it's hard to draw information or whatever, but here it is. This is the information. All of this should seem pretty accurate to you at this point. Like, yeah, proper names, it's just the name and the, and the object. This is like an unmeaning mark. And then in the case of definite descriptions, there's this extra bit. There's the information. There's the meaning part. And maybe even it's by way of this information that this name refers to this guy. But it's going to turn out that this can't be exactly right. Gottlob Frege, who lived in Germany many years after Mill, is gonna introduce some cases that show that even proper names, they have to involve something else. They have to involve some, some extra bit of information, some extra level of meaning by which we get to the thing signified. Uh, we'll get to that next week in this course.